calling myla plus at second order and I want to note that we are divided h equal to h naught plus b where h naught was sum of the Fock operator. Hartree Fock orbital as the starting point of H naught eigen function, okay. So basically our psi 0, 0 is a psi Hartree Fock and E 0, 0 is sum of the orbital. So I am using A as an index for occupied orbitals. Then we had E naught 1 which was psi 0, 0 V psi 0, 0 which is psi Hartree Fock V psi Hartree Fock and your V was essentially since H naught is sum of Fock operator V was sum over 1 by Rij minus the V Hartree Fock one particle Fock at attendance V let us do it. So if I put this and apply Slater rule. This was, can somebody rem remember this value? What would be just E naught 1 applying Slater rule? Who can tell? So, V is just 1 by Rij. This would be added to the orbital energies eventually to get total Hartree Fock energy, okay. So, what is this value in terms of spin orbitals? Minus half, yes, sum over all AB, right. A B anti symmetrize AB, where these are the spin orbitals, right. So, minus half this, if you add this to the orbital energy, you will get the total because E A was H A A, again in terms of spin orbitals, I am writing plus sum over B A B anti symmetrize AB, okay. So, you had the B2. So, so, so A is not summed up of course for orbital energy of A. When I sum the orbital energy of A, this summation will come plus this is all AB. If I add the first order perturbation correction, you will get half of AB AB, okay. So that will give you Hartree Fock energy. So I just want to make sure that you understand in terms of Slater rule, of course in terms of E naught 0, it is psi 0 0, H naught psi 0 0 and E naught 1 is psi 0 0, V psi 0 0. So, addition gives you Hartree Fock energy that is of course easy to see. So, your E 0 0 plus E 0 1 was the Hartree Fock energy. So, by our definition of correlation energy, the E correlation starts at second order. And then we went through the second order perturbation equation and we wrote an expression for the correlation energy which is the correction at the second order. So, you can also call by our old definition just E naught 2, E naught 2 is nothing but the correlation energy uh, at the, the first correlation energy contribution which is the second order because at the E naught 1 there may be a value but then that just adds up to Hartree Fock. So, our first correction terms comes from E naught 2 and we derive the expression that it is 1 by 4 A B and R S where R S are virtual orbitals and A Bs are occupied orbitals. Okay. So, I hope till this point all of you can derive this. This was actually derived. Okay, initially we wrote all uh, all excited determinants of H naught, but we found that the single singly excited determinants do not contribute because of Brillouin's theorem. So we had only doubly excited, 
and then we use again Slater rules for the doubly excited which was simply the, the two electrons AB anti-symmetrized RS mod square, we had A less than B R less than A initially, then we set all AB RS and since A equal to B R equal to S anyway is 0, so it does not half. So then we have a factor 1 by 2 for this pair, 1 by 2 for this pair, so you got 1 by 4. So I hope all of you remember this derivation. So the homework essentially starts from here. So please give, give it on Monday that you have to now write this anti-symmetrized integrals in regular integrals and write an expression, see which are equal, use the symmetry to make sure that you just do not, should not just expand in one line. That expansion is one line I can also do, ABRS minus ABSR, RSAB, but try to simplify in terms of regular integrals, which is still in terms of spin orbitals, then do a sp spin integral. So that was essentially, uh, so eventually land up into a correlation energy for in terms of special orbitals. Both both for the occupied and virtual orbitals, we have a special orbital. Remember the entire thing is of course done for ground state, and a closed shell, so essentially a closed shell system where the eigenfunction of H naught is a single determinant. In fact, all eigenfunctions are single determinant, not only that. It is a single determinant which turns out to be a restricted determinant. Restricted essentially means it is a closed shell. So that is, that has been the requirement for deriving this particular formula. However, if it is a single determinant and not restricted, I told you there are other Hartree-Fock like unrestricted Hartree-Fock, restricted open cell, a similar derivation can be done. It is not really a problem, but I am just telling that this particular derivation is, is follows the restricted determinant, restricted Hartree-Fock determinant. So you uh, essentially get this as the first correction to the Hartree-Fock energy and that requires the in two electron integrals between two sets of occupied orbitals and two sets of virtual orbitals. At this point, they are spin orbitals, but we will discuss what happens when you integrate and get these special orbitals. So let us now go ahead and try to understand this. I was, yeah. MP1 correction. For unrestricted heart reform, yeah, that will also be, we have still uh, the same, you know, same situation. Yeah. So for so first order anyway, it will get back the heart reform energy because that is for a very simple reason. You just add up H naught and V. Whatever is your size zero zero, your E naught zero is size zero zero, H naught size zero zero. E naught one is size zero zero, V is size zero zero. So if you add it up, so that has nothing to do with anything. In fact, as long as you have this structure, you will always get first order giving you Hartree Fock or reference energy. I would not call Hartree Fock in that case. In the case of UHF, it is UHF, but you can have a more complicated reference. Even then, what you will get is a reference energy, which is which is the uh, psi 0, 0, H psi 0, 0. So that is what I call the reference energy, yes. So basically, what I mean to say, whatever you do, these two quantities will give you psi 0, 0. H size 0, 0. And as long as this is a reference function, this is a reference energy, so I am not calling it correlation energy. And at least for a single determinant, I do not call it correlation energy. So whether it is RHF or UHF, it does not matter. Okay. So one of the things that we have seen is, of course, the importance of doubly excited determinant. 
Note that in this process of getting E naught 2, we had first got psi 0 1, which is a first order correction to the web function. Remember psi 0 0 is psi hat report, but we also got psi 0 1, which is a linear combination of all eigenstates of H naught except hat report, correct. So, if when you when you did this, you remember our first correction just like here was actually from the doubly excited determinant, okay. And so, we wrote this as psi ABRS and the matrix elements or the linear sorry linear combination coefficients for this determinants was this matrix element divided by epsilon a plus epsilon b minus epsilon r minus epsilon b or essentially the difference of these two energies okay in a reverse order. So, this minus this. So, this is psi 0 1 and actually if you remember by e, our E naught 2 was psi Hartree-Fock V psi 0 1 from there we got an original expression and then we applied Slater rules here. So, we can apply the Slater rule of course here just like we did here, but that is not what I want to show. What I want to show that the first order correction to the wave function which is the first important correction to psi Hartree-Fock uh, to uh, from the psi Hartree-Fock is uh, actually starts from the doubly excited term. The singly excited determinants which you might have guessed should be the first correction, it does not come because the corresponding matrix element becomes 0 because of Brillouin's theorem. So, Brillouin's theorem essentially dictates that if you start from Hartree-Fock, you have a Brillouin's theorem and then the first important determinant that contribute to the lowest perturbation order is actually doubly excited determinant psi ABRS. So, that is why I want to highlight the importance of double excited determinant and part of it will be discussed again when you do CI and is also the content of Sinonoglu's uh, review that I had given you to read, which is essentially known today as a pair correlation theory. So, this is actually a much, uh, much uh, broader perspective. Essential idea later we will see is that this correlation essentially means that I have two electrons, let us say they are AB, spin orbitals AB they get excited. So, this is somewhere here, let us say I am just taking a two level system. So, one orbital, two spin orbitals, one orbital, two spin orbitals. So, they get excited together to some RS to form what is called the doubly excited determinant. So, in a very graphical manner, the two pairs are getting excited together, okay, to form doubly excited determinant. They get excited. Essentially, Correlation essentially means they are getting excited. So, this is why it in general it is called a pair correlation theory. Later we will see for a many particle problems, we can have another set of pair which can also get excited and these two excitations can take place at the same time. So, time is of course here just for understanding. But if it takes place at the same time, what you will see is actually a fourfold excitation, which will come, which will be a quadruply excited determinant. But the probability of this taking place is nothing but since they are taking place simultaneously and independently, will be a product of this pair and this pair. So, this is the content of the Sinanoglu's later pair correlation theory. But at this point, let us let us say that the more important determinants come because of the two electron excitation. Now, why excitation is related to correlation? Now, I want to tell very physically. What does the correlation mean? <coughs> okay, physically, let us try to understand. So, you have an Hamiltonian and we are trying to solve the Schrodinger equation. Note that I have been mentioning this and this is a very important part of the correlation. Let us again understand two particle problem. If I have two particles R1, R2, okay, and in the limit of R1 tending to R2, which means the coordinates of the two particles, of course, the particles cannot be traced, the particles have only a probability being anywhere, but whenever the particles are at R1 and R2, what will first happen to the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian can be defined for a given R1 and R2, right? If you look at this Hamiltonian, you have a 1 by R12 term. 
right. So, at R1 tends to R2, this 1 by R12 will become infinity. So, this is what is called singularity. So, this becomes in the limit a singular Hamiltonian. If you have an in singular Hamiltonian essentially means it is infinite because 1 by R12 is becoming infinity. And then normally for an infinite operator, the wave function, whatever the wave function is, energy will become infinite. It is just like multiplying an infinity times a finite number, you get infinity. So, even if psi is not in infinite function, it is a finite function, since it is a singular operator, when it acts on this, this will become infinity. So, which means energy will become infinity. Of course, such energies are not allowed. We are looking at finite energy system. So, if it is a finite energy system, then what is the allowed wave function? So, the allowed wave function for such a case where Hamiltonian is singular is that the psi of R1, R2 must go to 0 because that is the only way this can survive because infinity of course acting on 0 can be finite. So, energy can still be finite, but the wave function cannot be finite. I hope you understand it is just like a multiplication. It is a very loose manner I am saying like infinity acting on a 0 can be finite, but infinity acting on a finite is infinity. So, just like that, the only possibility is that the wave function must become 0. So, whenever these two particles come close together, wave function becomes 0. What does it mean? Wave function is a sign of probability, mod psi square is a probability. So, we can now make a statement that there is a vanishing probability of two particles coming together, right. So, let us make this statement for the correlation energy that the probability that the two particles come together is 0 in any system because you, you, you imagine that they have they have only we, we can only talk in terms of probability. So, the vanishing probability, probability or probability density of two particles. coming together or you know in a very loose manner and this is how Sinonaglu actually argues in a very loose physical manner that the entire all the n particles are actually moving, they are colliding. So, whenever they come close together, the probability is 0. What it means that they cannot come close together. So, in the Hartree fog, let us see in the Hartree fog what happens. If you look at Hartree fog, let us say again two particle problem. So, Hart, so restricted Hartree fog A bar. So, that is my Hartree fog wave function, right. I hope you understand the, the terminology. A is A alpha, A bar is A beta. So, you have a restricted Hartree fog, A is the 1s orbital or whatever. So, you have alpha spin, you have a beta spin. Now, obviously, the two particles are in the same spatial orbital. Although their spins are different, they are in the spatial orbitals. So, there is a possibility of the two electrons. which are anti parallel ok coming close to each other which means the then when you when you calculate the probability there is a prob probability of the two electrons coming close for anti parallel spin however for parallel spins they are unlikely to come because their orbitals are different so they will avoid each other parallel spin so, the real problem in the Hartree Fock is that the, for anti parallel spins, this part of the exact nature is not being followed okay, by the Hartree Fock wave function. So, this is basically for the Hartree Fock. So, in Hartree Fock theory, this there is a vanishing probability. So, how is that how is that done in the perturbation theory when you go beyond Hartree Fock? Is that as soon as these two particles come close together, they will anti parallel spin they will try to avoid and the one way to avoid is to actually get excited. So, if you get excited at least there is a less probability of crowding. Please remember we are only talking in terms of probability. So, we cannot say that they, there is there is uh, that they will actually come or not come the probability is 0. So, when you give a more space 
there is a possibility of avoiding each other. If you are in a crowded space, if you look at n particles in a crowded space, they are going to collide with each other. So the virtual orbitals give you that space. Virtual orbitals essentially tell you that I can actually go away. Of course, you may argue that if they are going away to two virtual or same virtual orbital with again opposite spin, that is what the singlet does, then again they will be together. But the point is now the probability is being reduced. There is a some probability of being here, some probability of being here, some probability of being here because there are so many virtual orbitals. So it is only a question of probability. It is whenever of course there is a singlet, the two electrons will be in the same special orbitals with antiparallel spin. Okay? But if I have many options, like I have only one option here in the Hartree Fock, AA bar, but now all RR bars which are virtual orbitals are opening up as an option. So the probability gets reduced. So essentially probability just gets reduced. So that is how the argument of Sinanaglu went. Again, it is a very qualitative argument. It is not a quantitative argument. It is qualitative ar un argument to understand what is correlation and why doubly excited are important. The further argument that Sinanaglu gives, the single excitations are of course not important because of Brillouin's theorem. So of course one can argue why not three particles. And again, Sinanaglu had a very brilliant argument. He said three particles in any case cannot come close together because they cannot be in the same orbital, even in Hartree form because of Pauli principle. So three particles cannot come close together, that is number one. Number two is that the V or the Hamiltonian which makes them correlate has only a maximum of two particle interaction. So it has only one particle and two particle interaction because of Coulomb. So it is very hard for that Hamiltonian to correlate three particles together. So, so that is another argument that he gave that why three particle onwards is also going to be small, why it is only the two particle which is important. So the entire correlation he said is dominated by what he called pair correlation theory. And I think if you read this a very nice, you know, Sinanagli actually told in physical terms what we will talk later about the couple cluster doubles and so on. But after that he did not, unfortunately as I told you, he did not give a full rigor. He gave a rigor to some extent but not the complete rigor. He did not actually, you know, set out equations and so on and that was his weakness. And then later other people came. But the idea of the two particle correlation being the dominant correlation really came from the Sinanoglu's theory. So that is why I just thought I will spend a few minutes, though that is not really uh, something that I would like to dwell. Those who are interested should read the Sinanoglu's paper on advances in chemical physics. There is a lot of other insights that you will get. Okay. So I think this is very important. We will see this again in the context of configuration interaction that the doubles are important. So we are first arguing that the wave function itself will have only pair correlation, doubles. And of course, the wave function has doubles and energy will also have similarly E naught 2. E naught 2 can be obtained from this. So that is a, a triviality. The point that we are trying to say that the psi 0 1 contains mainly doubly excited determinants and not triples. Why not triples? Of course, by Slater rule, you know why not triples. But what Sinanaglu did was actually to give a physical insight to this formula. No, that is comes from the perturbation theory itself. That Sinanaglu did not do. Sinanaglu argued from a different point of view that there are two particles which can be in the same orbital in the Hartree form, particularly the antiparallel spins. That is number one. So they have to be correlated because correlation is essentially making sure that such things do not happen. Okay? So two particles should not come close together. So then you have to give a space for them to go somewhere. So they can go to any other virtual orbitals. So that space allows them to avoid coming close together. That is number one. Number two is that three particles onwards are unimportant because they cannot come close together by the same argument and the Hamiltonian is only two particles. So actually what Sinanaglu is trying to do is to justify what you get from the perturbation theory by physical insight. He is not using this because if you are using this anyway it is very clear. I mean perturbation theory of course will tell you first order triples cannot come because of Slater rules. But that Slater rule itself is being justified in some other way you can say because he has not used this formula. Sinanaglu did not use perturbation theory. 
his arguments were much more qualitative and this actually are what what it turns out to be coupled cluster theory which is not really perturbation theory. So, you will see, so we do not use perturbation theory, perturbation first order perturbation only justifies what Sinaloglu had told that the pair correlation is important, okay. So, he is not using this. So, we will come back to this when we discuss uh, the coupled cluster again qualitatively. Please remember that we will, we cannot have classes, we are not going to discuss very thoroughly uh, many of these new methods. But at least I thought the perturbation we will discuss and try to give a justification of the Sinanaglu's theory. I had also mentioned in the previous class that if you do a restricted Hartree Fock, let us say for hydrogen molecule, for hydrogen molecule at a large distance, so at R H H tending to infinity right the e rhf does not become twice e hydrogen atom so this is something that i mentioned we actually it becomes greater than the two hydrogen atom it goes to h plus h minus configuration and mainly that happens because of uh, the spins remaining attached it's a singlet wave function so they remain attached to one s here and one s here so let us try to understand this problem a little bit better. So remember my molecular orbitals are formed out of linear combination of atomic orbitals which are my two bases. So let us assume that those bases are 1s hydrogen A, 1s hydrogen B. Again by the same nomenclature their original energies are identical when before the molecular start, molecular is formed. Then you have the phi 1 and phi 2 are the two orbitals, special orbitals that are formed. These are the special orbitals, molecular orbitals. So I, I, all of us know that one of them is anti-bonding, one of them is anti-bonding, one of them is bonding and the bonding orbital is let us say phi 1. So your Hartree Fock then becomes or RHF then becomes phi 1, phi 1 bar. Correct. So I hope the nomenclatures are clear. So when I'm calling phi one, it's a mo for the interaction region. So what happens for the psi RHF as R tends to infinity? So let's as, let's try to understand this. As the R goes to infinity, what happens to first phi one and phi two? These are the special orbital. Both of them go to the one s orbital. That is clear, right? Because they were started from one s orbital and they had a bonding and anti-bonding orbitals. If I do the reverse MO diagram, then phi 1 will go to one of the 1s, phi 2 will go to one other 1s. Which one goes to where, I do not know. So the molecular orbitals become atomic in nature at R tending to infinity, which is not surprising because there is no molecule at that point. So when we say LC AO MO approach, although AOs were used only as a basis, since I am using the AOs, there is a physical interpretation to this that these MOs will eventually become AO. So that is where LCAO MO picture has a chemistry inside. It is not just a basis. So my 1S was not just a basis. It has a physical insight that if I take this molecule apart, these molecular orbitals will go over to this, this basis function because they are atomic orbital basis. I hope all of chemistry you know. If I would have some, used some other basis, crazy basis, then it would not have happened because eventually they go over to the atomic orbitals. But because I have used the atomic orbitals and bases, these phi 1 and phi 2 go over to the 1s hydrogen. So then what happens to the wave function at that region? So psi Hartree Fock at R tends to infinity will then become 1s hydrogen A and let us say 1s hydrogen B bar, correct? Because one of the phi 1s will become 1s hydrogen A, phi 2 will also become 1s hydrogen A, but now you have 1s hydrogen A, 1s hydrogen B if they go separately or what is worse is that they may, they will more likely become this because both of them are phi 1. So if phi 1 becomes 1s hydrogen A, then it will become 1s hydrogen A, 1s hydrogen A bar 
and this is precisely the configuration which is H minus H plus because what, what does it show? It shows both the electrons are in one of the 1s orbital. By chance, if you can write this as phi 1, phi 2 bar, then of course it will become 1s hydrogen A, 1s hydrogen B bar, but that is still not right because you know for a singlet wave function, if I have a degenerate, you cannot have this and this, you have to mix, okay. So this is of course a singlet wave function. There is no problem with this wave function. This is a proper singlet wave function starting from a singlet, but this is a wrong asymptotic behavior, okay. So wrong asymptotic behavior means it does not separate to the correct result because you know that if I have gas phase hydrogen, if I dissociate, it should become hydrogen atom plus hydrogen atom and not H minus H plus. I hope all of you know this. I have, I have told this gas phase, any diatomic molecule becomes A plus B not A plus B minus or A minus B plus, okay, never happens because ionization potential of any atom is greater than the electron affinity of any atom. So you can never have A plus B minus as a ground state. A, A and B together, sum would be much lower than A plus B minus because ionization of any, any atom is very high. I mean you look at hydrogen ionization, hydrogen ionization is how much? 13.6 electron volt which is 300 kilocalories roughly, okay, 320 whatever. So, no, two, 300 kilocalories, I think 23, 13 into 2, 20 is 260 and 40. So, roughly three, 300 kilocalories, which is already 1200, 1300 kilojoules almost. So, you can imagine greater than 1200 kilojoules, which is so high just to make H to H plus. So, H minus H plus will be so high. How much of energy you can gain by H minus? Very little. 1200-1300 kilojoule, remember, is larger than nitrogen bond breaking. If you do a homolytic nitrogen bond breaking, it is about 900 kilojoule. CH bond breaking or hydrogen bond breaking is 400 some kilojoules. We have done that exercise. Oxygen bond breaking is also 700 to 800 kilojoules, somewhere 800 let us say. Nitrogen is about 890 or 900, but hydrogen ionization itself is more than 1200 kilojoules. You know, many times you do not realize this, these numbers. So, ionization is so difficult, okay. Hydrogen is of course quite large, for other atoms it may even be less, that is a different matter, like cesium is most easily ionizable, but even then that number is very, very large. So, that is the reason. A heterolytic bond cleavage in chemistry is much more difficult than a homolytic bond cleavage. So if I have a meth methane molecule, I do a homolytic cleavage, CH3 radical and hydrogen atom, right? That is much easy to do than CH3 minus H plus, which is deprotonation, right? So deprotonation is much more difficult because it requires very high energy, simply because of the hydrogen ionization, that kills the problem. So I just want to tell you why the H minus H plus is of course a wrong asymptote because in gas phase this is a very high energy. So the ground state should actually go to H plus H which I am not getting. So the question is how do you get H plus H singlet? So let us try to see the wave function that we should get in the asymptote. So let us look at what we should actually get in the asymptote. So, for hydrogen molecule again, so the asymptot, asymptotic singlet states. So, you had this phi 1 here, you had the phi 2 here and this was my two 1s functions, right, is the usual curve that we plot. So, eventually each of these states will go to one of these, which one goes where it does not matter. So, I will add the asymptot. I will have these two states only. What will be a singlet state? I will have 1s a h a, 1s h b bar, right, but that is not enough. I have already told you for a 2 electron singlet in a degenerate, you have to do the other. So, you have to also add or subtract 1s h a bar, 
one s h zero. And of course, with some combination coefficients, so that's not important. Okay. In this case, it will be simply one by square root two. That's the un unimportant. The uh, the point is uh, um, with the with an overlap integral, and that overlap will anyway go to zero. Okay. At the r tending to infinity. So we already know this in this case. So it will become simply one by square root two. But the point is, the asymptotic singlet wave function is actually not a single configuration. So that is the first thing to understand. You have what we call a multi configuration or two configuration in the asymptote. Okay, it's a linear combination of two different determinants. So I'm calling it two configuration. So either if you use RHF or even if you use UHF, these are all single determinants. As soon as I break them apart, none of these will actually go to the asymptote correctly. Though I had already mentioned that the UHF energy goes correctly, but it is not a singlet. That's a problem. I am talking of a singlet state. So the UHF energy goes correctly to the exact energy, but then it's not a singlet. So if I want a singlet asymptote, of course UHF cannot give, RHF cannot give. Even if I would have put phi 1, phi 2 bar as my determinant there, okay, you would still not get because you will get only one of these. You won't get a linear combination. So Right in the beginning, you have to start with phi 1, phi 2 bar and phi 2, phi 1 bar. Your original RHF, or original reference wave function, then only you will get this as the asymptote. Is it clear? But this is against the spirit of Hartree Fock. This is not Hartree Fock, right? This is not Hartree Fock. Hartree Fock has always one determinant. So the point that I am trying to mention that if I start with one determinant, Hartree Fock, and try to split or try to separate the molecule, I will never get the asymptote correctly, okay. And particularly, I am giving an example of a singlet and I cannot get the singlet either way, whether I do RHF and UHF, though energy in UHF is close to the exact energy because of uh, certain variation method that the energy goes down, it comes closer. But the wave function you will never get. So if you want to get a proper singlet wave function, you can see that the Hartree Fock itself is not good. So the question then we can ask is if I do a MP first order correction to the wave function, remember when I say MP2 that is for energy. For the wave function, what is the first order correction? First correction at the first order, correct? So remember this. Do not say MP2 for wave function also, okay? Only for energy, first order correction gives back with the 0th order Hartree Fock. But as far as the wave function is concerned, psi 0 0 itself is Hartree Fock and psi 0 1 is different, okay. And that psi 0 1 gives you E naught 2 because of that formula. So psi 0 1 has to be something different from Hartree Fock, okay. So if you apply this, we would like to know are we improving the system. So if I just use a RHF, I hope you understand the problem, we will discuss that next class. If I just use RHA 5 1 5 1 bar and then do a first order perturbation correction to the wave function, am I improving the result in the asymptote? So we want to discuss the, the behavior of psi 0 1 as R tends to infinity, okay, along with the Hartree Fock. So it is important, of course, that my final wave function at the first order will be psi 0 0 plus psi 0 1. So the question that I am going to ask, does it behave even qualitatively? Correct. In R H H, the region which tends to infinity. Again, we will take only hydrogen molecule as a prototype case and we can even simplify the problem by taking a two basis. So only we will take a two basis just like we did here, phi 1 and phi 2, two basis. So we will take the simplest LCAMO. We have one, one virtual orbital where you can excite both the electrons, right. So this RS can be generated because you have two special orbitals, you have two uh, uh, four spin orbitals actually. So we can very easily study this problem. Uh, you can yourself try to do, you know, at, at your end. What do you get? Finally, 
what I am interested in these weapons, when I add to the hot report and then add to the hot report wave function this first order correction, okay. So, of course, your ABRS will change because they are spin orbitals. So, let us say I have A and B are orbital, this will become A, A bar, this will become B, B bar. I hope it is clear if A and B are special orbitals, then this will actually become A, A bar, this will become B, B bar in terms of special orbitals. So, I mean this is just a nomenclature, uh, you can use some other nomenclature for special orbitals, alpha, beta, whatever. So, the point is that you can easily study this model problem that am I separating hydrogen correctly because this is a very, very important problem because if I am not able to separate hydrogen correctly, there is something to worry. How do I separate? I already told you one way to separate would have been to start from this, which means have a have whatever you call it reference or Hutri fork, but it is not a single determinant Hutri fork. It is a two configuration Hutri fork. And this is a very important to understand all multi reference problems in quantum chemistry, why multi reference problems comes in the reference. So, you can see my reference function itself should have been two reference function, that is one way to definitely solve. But if my reference is just phi 1, phi 1 bar, then do perturbation like here, does it help? That is a question. So that is the question that we will ask, okay. If I of course start with this, I, I know my reference itself is good enough, at least qualitatively to separate. But if I do not do that and I start with phi 1, phi 1 bar just as we are doing here for the Hartree fork and then do a first order perturb perturbation, shall I get the asymptote correctly? I hope the question is understood, okay, because this is a very important question. If I would have started with this, anyway I would have got the asymptote correctly because this would become 1 as A, this will become 1 as B or vice versa, does not matter, both the determinants are there. So, first thing to understand that in the asymptotic limit, the singlet wave function is of this form, that is very important to understand. I hope that is very clear because we have already given you a theorem that each of this determinant is not spin adapted, please do not forget that theorem. That if I have n alpha and n beta, in this case n alpha and n beta equal to 1, so one number of orbitals must be doubly occupied, which is not true in either of these cases. So, these are now like molecular orbitals, the same molecular, there is no difference between MO and AO at R 10 to infinity, so do not get confused. So, this determinant is not spin adapted, this determinant is not spin adapted. However, a spin adapted wave function would be a combination of these two determinants and this is very simple to understand that I am saying that neither of these is correct, but a combination of these is correct where this can be alpha or this can be beta, this can be beta or this can be alpha for a degenerate space. This is correct and that is that is also physically right because we cannot pinpoint what is electron 1 and what is electron 2. Electrons are indistinguishable, so you cannot write like this, you have to add this. So, obviously, any one of these determinants is wrong, but, but a correction term is right. The question is if I start with phi 1, phi 1 bar, can I generate that? okay, by doing a perturbation correction. You can actually find the answer, in fact, you will get the answer itself, yes. Psi ABRS means phi 2 phi 2 bar, in phi, uh, phi 2 phi 2 bar in this case, yeah. So, so what is asking is the psi, a, what is psi ABRS? A and B are phi 1 phi 1 bar, you have two state problem. So, there is only one virtual state. So, this is nothing but determinant 2 2 bar or phi 2 phi 2 bar. So, you can easily see whether the result will come or not. Actually, the answer is no, you can actually see this because I need phi 1 phi 2 bar plus phi 2 phi 1 bar. I do not need phi 1 phi 1 bar plus phi 2 phi 2 bar. So, I know all since the question is already put, it is very trivial to see that you will still not get it. So, that is a very disturbing thing that my RHF is not good for dissociation. I do a first order perturb correction, it is still not good. Okay, and I will, I will do it in detail, but you can clearly see from the discussion, it is still not good. So, what is good is actually to start from this, there is no other way. That means, I do not do this, I do not start from this RHF at all, I do not start from any single determinant. My original determinant, original function itself is this and then I try to improve. In fact, very 
loosely, I would say these are the basis of all multi-reference problems. Like you have multi-reference CI, you have multi-reference perturbation theory and so on, okay. So I think this is something that is qualitatively very important to understand because we can't really spend a lot of time on multi-reference because we are going to go back to single reference CI after this. But I just thought I would mention why multi-reference is important at least in one context of dissociation. And these are, these are very important problems where a molecule is closed shell but is dissociated into two open cell fragments. I had given you this theorem. That is when RHF failed. If it was a closed cell molecule, I do want to dissociate into two closed cell molecules, then there is no problem. So for example, if I would dissociate H2 to H plus H minus, there would have been no problem. I want, I do not want H plus H, I want an excited state, no problem because both of them are closed cells. So the problem is whenever a closed cell molecule fragments into two open cell parts, there is a problem and the problem cannot be washed away by simply doing MP2 or first order correction to the waveform, second order, it cannot be washed away. So we will see how do you handle such problems. In fact, we will talk not much about the multi-reference, so that is why I am just bringing the relevance of the multi-reference. Why? Why people still have to do multi-reference? Most of the course we are going to do single reference, starting reference functions are single determinant as we have done for the perturbation, okay. So what we will do now after discussion, continuing the discussion, closing it, we will go to actually CI. But I think what I like to do also is to describe this perturbation energy that we wrote E02, uh, of course in terms of special orbital but by the time assignments will be due. Uh, but more importantly, how to represent them in a very convenient language and that is something that you should learn and that is called the diagrammatics. There is a diagrammatic perturbation theory which means the same algebra that you are deriving in a very laborious manner and that is important at least from E03 onwards that things will become more and more difficult. How do I conceptualize this by drawing a simple diagrams? And I have been telling this the diagrams are, I told you certain diagram like scattering goes from 0 to excited state, come back. A more, I would say a rigorous way of writing at least E02 and E03 in terms of diagrams is something that I will introduce. Introduction would be slightly ad hoc because to rigorously learn diagrams, how they have come, you should also learn what is called second quantization which also we will do later, but I think next class I will, I will in ad hoc manner I will introduce the diagrams and diagrams are very pictorial. So all of you will be able to understand very easily. There is no algebra actually. So the maths, there is no maths. The maths is actually written in terms of diagrams. So whatever we wrote E02, that formula is written in terms of diagrams and, and after that only we will go to CI. So two configuration alone is not enough. That is what I am trying to see. If I would write just 1s a, 1s a bar, 1s b, 1s b bar, that is also not enough, okay. Then I, then what I am doing, I am getting only h minus h plus in two different ways. One's putting these two electrons here, one's putting, but that is not enough for singlet. I have to have in this manner, if this is 1s a, this is 1s b, this manner, which is not coming by the RHF, which is not coming but even MP1 wave function first order corrected work and I think I will do that, I will complete it but since the discussion already took place, you can see the answer, okay. But I am just trying to tell you the context why people do in many, many cases. This is at least one context. There are other reasons people do. There are other cases where multi-reference also comes in but this is at least one and this is the simplest that I can tell you, hydrogen. Nothing can be simpler than that. Hydrogen in two bases, you know, that is what you, you learn all your life but you do not realize what are the problems, okay. That it cannot, sigma g, sigma g bar is all that you have read, it cannot dissociate. If you add sigma u, sigma u bar, it still cannot dissociate. That is what you are doing, right, by MP1 and that is what I will tell. So because you need sigma g, sigma u bar, sigma g bar, sigma u, right. So 1 alpha, 1 beta, 1 beta, 1 alpha and that is not coming. Because each of your functions is just a singlet function to start with. So if your determinant itself is spin adapted by adding you will not get this because each of them is not spin adapted here. The combination is, so there is a little bit of a physics here. 
So, this cannot be obtained by simply adding two spin adapter determinants, no. I hope you understand what I mean. The combination is spin adapted, although each of them is not. So, that is a part of the problem here. So, this physics is slightly complex, you, we will have a discussion again in next class and then probably introduce diagrams before we go to CI, okay, alright.